Great to uh, chat with you about the new album, Leave a Scar. Um, a lot has happened since I last chatted with you. And my understanding is this album is kind of a reaction to the crazy times we're living in, the crazy times of the last year, venting that anger and frustration that we've all felt. Can you tell me what um, inspired this record? Was it made during lockdown? It definitely was made uh, during this past COVID year and absolutely inspired by the state of the world pandemic wise and politically. Um, I mean, pretty much the world <laughs> the bed in 2020, uh, as we like to say in, in Brooklyn. And um, uh, and I actually thought that I, I had told my family, my friends, my management and my band that I was no longer recording or going to do any live shows uh, from this from the end of from August 2019 on I said I'm done. Like and, forever, uh, forever done. Yeah, forever. I mean, and and people when I find when I when I contacted my management and said I decided to do a record, their response was, you know, we don't believe you when you say things like you're not performing anymore, and which I said, dude, I gave away my stage boots I've been wearing for 20 years to a fan. I I really thought that I was I I signed them. My number one fan lives in Toronto, Keith, rock on. D. Snyder and I boxed them and sent them. I said, "Put them in your man cave." So Keith, if you're listening, could you send me my boots? Yeah, back? Keith needs to send them back. <laughs> but uh, before we get into the record, I have to know, as someone who's been in the business for you know for forty plus years and always been rocking out, like why why were you considering permanent retirement? Well, I did want to be one of those people who stays past his uh, ex expiration date. And um, I was feeling, uh, you know, like at 60, well, it was 2019, so 65. I was feeling like, you know, it shouldn't hurt when you throw horns. I, uh, my, <laughs> it's literally hurting every time I throw horns. I'm not saying ow out loud, but I don't want to get to the point where I'm still up there going ow, ow, ow. And I also, you know, I wanted to, I, I also felt like with um, for the love of metal, I achieved what I wanted to achieve in many ways, returning to the metal scene, being accepted, acknowledged, recognized, and having a, a, a top metal album of the year. And I said, you know, maybe I should just drop the mic now and walk away. And there's so many other things I do. I've written my first novel. I've co-created a kids animated show that Peacock's developing right now. I, I'm going to be directing my first movie uh, that I wrote. Um, I've written many movies, but this one I'm directing. So I had creative outlets and I just felt, okay, this is one thing I want to close on a high note. Mm. But the state of the world just said, all right, you've got a platform. You have a voice people need for you. Some, there are people out there who don't have that voice and you need to speak for those who can't speak for themselves. And then you wrote a song called I Gotta Rock Again. Now I understand yeah. why you have a song called I Gotta Rock Again. Well, that was kind of one of the trigger points. There was a few trigger points. Uh, one was social media and by railing online about anti-maskers and anti-faxers and politics and this and that. And, and saying, people, you can't sit silently by the, the vast majority in the middle, the moderates. You can't just sit there. Uh, the, the, the phrases that are always used by moderates is, I think things will work out. I'm hoping for the best. It usually goes back to the middle. Like as Dr. Phil says, how's that working out for you? <laughs> I mean, that's exactly why the entire world's in this mess because of that sort of laissez-faire kind of, oh, I'm sure it'll be fine. Uh, I trust it'll be okay. Um, you know, time's over for that. And someone tweeted me and said, but Dean, we don't all have the voice of the platform. And that's where I said, well, I guess that's, I do. I'm that guy. Okay. So, uh, but one of the passing, the other trigger point was just a passing thought where I said, man, I got to rock again. And I chuckled. <laughs> Boy, that, that's a D Snyder song. I've ever heard one. And I wrote down the title because I always work with titles. And I said, you know, I'm probably not the only person feeling like this right now. And that really set things off uh, on me on writing. And by the way, I had stopped writing in 1995. I have not written anything since then. So uh, this was 25 years later. I called Jimmy Joss. I said, I, I want to do another record and I want to be involved in the writing on this one. I need to, I have got something to say. Mm -hmm. So the last time actually that I interviewed you was not the time you came to Yahoo in 2019 or so. It was on the phone 
right at the beginning of the pandemic, right when we were starting to realize that this was getting serious, that the world was in the bed, as you say, uh, your daughter was stranded in Brazil during the pandemic, right? She couldn't travel back home. How did, is she okay? Like, is she back home, I assume? She's fine. fine. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be doing an interview with one of the people in Brazil who helped me get her out. That was like the longest two weeks of my life. Uh, I don't think I took a full breath. Um, and uh, it was, and I was exploring every possible option. I mean, I, I just, and people say, oh, well, you know, it's, you know, you're famous. Uh, let me tell you something. It wasn't, that was what it was about. It was about picking up phones and blowing people up and squeaking so loud that people finally started paying attention. And eventually, uh, I know my daughter's name was brought up in the, by the State Department in Washington. And, uh, and, you know, and we got her out of there uh, safely and in one piece. And it was not easy. But I was actually in Kentucky touch with black ops people. There were military people, uh, um, um, mercenaries on the ground in South America who were headed in that direction. I was, I mean, I was doing, I, I was Liam Neeson. I've got a unique skill set, you know, and I was gonna get my daughter out no matter what. But she came out and when I remember when she landed in Miami and she sent the picture and it was like, and I said, great, she's home, snotty attitude intact. <laughs> Uh, because I never want that snotty attitude taken from her. Yeah. Because some horrible thing happened in the jungles of Peru, you know? It was Peru. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, yeah uh, obviously, now here we are. We all kind of, you know, it's that was about a year and a half ago. Now I'm talking to you again. And we all, you know, we all were kind of hoping the pandemic would be over by now. And, and there has that was been March of 2020. That's my God, right? Mm hmm. So, yeah, how I mean, I guess there's some I mean, there's definitely been some hope and some change and some progress. And, you know, the vaccine was a big part of that. But, you know, you were mentioning the anti-maskers and the anti-vaxxers and you never shy on social media. So have you been dealing with them on uh, your Twitter lately? Oh, yeah. There's a song on, and, and, and Jamie Jasta, uh, my producer, and this is, a set, this is only the first time I ever used the same production team on consecutive albums. I never returned to, uh, but, but I didn't even think twice about that Jamie, when I went decided to record, Jamie was the guy. And so we were, Jamie, myself, and Charlie Belmore, my guitar player, we did the writing on the record. So Jamie came in with a, a song title idea. He goes, Dee, uh, he says, watching you on social media, when trolls come after you, I, I feel sorry for them because it's like you just tear them to shreds. He said, it's open season on trolls. And I said, open season. I always work with titles, open season. So the t opening line on that is on that open season is, hey, mother are you kidding me? That's the first line. And I, you know, it's just like, this is a lesson that I give for free. Uh, so schooling people is one of my favorite things. But yeah, I, I, I don't shy away on, on social media and I'm not shying away now. It's weird to me. And I'm painting with a wide brush here. I'm not speaking about everybody, but there's a lot of people in the metal fan base that, or metal community that seem to be kind of conservative in the sense that like when someone like you or Sebastian Bach or Tommy Lee or Paul Stanley, who was very, and Gene Simmons, who were very pro mask, you know, whenever, or even Tom Morello, like, hello, when they share political views, like a lot of their fans are, you know, they come after them. Obviously they're no match for someone like you, but I, I've always been kind of surprised by that because to me, that genre was built on a song like, we're not gonna take it. It's built on rebellion and, you know, it's very weird to me that there's this conservative streak through the metal. Yeah, well, first of all, you've hit on a couple of, you know, a couple of things here. Uh, it, one is that there is a conservative streak in the metal world. Some of those people are very right wing. Look, you go, you know, but, but then it shouldn't be a complete surprise. When you go back to like the 60s to the birth of punk and metal, bands like the MC5, who are very political, uh, and that Midwest metal, hard rock, whatever you want to call it, coming out of Detroit, they were not, they were blue collar, blue collar AF. And there's pictures of them posing with guns and flag. I mean, it's a, you know, so they were, but they were also, they were white Panthers. So they were socially conscious, but they also leaned like, 
kind of, you know, like right wing, you know, take my gun from my, my dying hands kind of thing. So there's a lot of that going on. I would, uh, there's, and also there's this stay in your lane thing. Shut uh, up and sing. Yeah, shut up and sing. Shut up and dribble. Shut up and, why don't you shut up and fix cars? Why don't you shut up and, and, do, and, and, and work at the bank? Why don't you shut up and teach? I mean, why is it we have to shut up and do what we do, which is bizarre. Then there's this other thing I just, and I, you know, and I, I've often, since this is a social media platform here in many, in many ways, um, even though you guys transcend that, of course, uh, I just, you know, I, I'm always marveling at the fact that if I post something about music, a few hundred, but if I post something about politics or odd things, like I like pancakes, one of my early big tweets, just I wrote, I like pancakes, and it was my biggest tweet to date. This is back like five years ago. I'm like, what? I like pancakes? This is your response to. I have a new song out. Nobody gives a So, so but I tweeted one of my, I had a huge response on a tweet. I just said, why is it? I said that I hate disco sucks. And these people are like, yeah, disco, rule, rule, do. You're said, not a fan of disco, D? Yeah, not a fan. And I said, We'll, we'll do, agree to disagree on that, said, but that's fine. Why are you, why do you care? How does my opinion of disco, how has that affected the history of disco? I hated it back in the 70s, yet it sold gazillions of records. It was the most popular movement of its time. I said, I, I said, hey, I hate golf and I hate the Grateful Dead. It doesn't seem to hurt their, the, the business either. What is wrong? Why are you so reactive? Because one person says, I don't like something. So that got thousands and thousands of retweets. And the oddest thing is people go, coming out going, well, to be honest, I don't like the Beatles and I, I, I don't like Led Zeppelin. People like coming out of the class admitting they don't like something popular. Who cares? That's what makes the world interesting. There's people who like metal, there's people who like disco. Who cares that one side doesn't like the other? Crazy. Doesn't social media, it, you don't seem like someone who gets easily exhausted, but doesn't it ever exhaust you? Just the, like, like you said, whether you're posting about something serious like COVID or you're posting about something not serious, like pancakes, it's just a deluge of reaction. Yes, <laughs> the answer is yes. And 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 I it was a, there was a Twitter thing that says, um, uh, and and was uh, in three words uh, sum up Twitter like your feelings, current feelings on Twitter. This was years ago, and I said verdict still out, and uh, you know, and I said I'm not so sure. I'm not. Yeah, we've got tens of hundreds of thousands of followers and blah, blah, blah. But I'm not so sure that it relates directly to our careers. And I remember Anton, well, not Anton, what's his name? Um, he, uh, I'm blanking out on the guys from the 70s show, uh, from that 70s show, the one who was on two and a half. Oh, minutes. Ashton Kutcher? Ashton, Ashton, not Anton, Ashton Kutcher. Mm -hmm. He had the biggest Twitter following at one point and he announced his new movie and it bombed at the box office. And I said, if Ashton Kusher with his gazillion, million, billion followers can't open his opening day, it tanked. So, and I don't know if he's really that active anymore because he must have said, well, what freaking good is this thing if people don't, again, if I tweet, got a new song, a few hundred, but I say, I like pancakes, several thousand, you know? So, I mean, I'm not sure of exactly the purpose of it, but this said, corporations are looking at your following. So anytime you do anything, like I've got this show over at Peacock, I know that they open up. D. Snyder's uh, producing a new show. I don't know how many? What's what's his what's his what's his following like? You know, is he is he relevant? Hey, I was on Cobra Kai. Okay, he's relevant. You are relevant. You have a, a topical record coming out in 2021, so very relevant. This album is very relevant to what's going on in the world. Well, thanks for saying that. I'm, I, as far in my own in my own head, I'm very relevant. That's all I need is is, uh, what, is my own voice in my head going, "You're relevant. You're relevant," and I'll keep going, folks. One thing that I want to say, obviously, you've been you know, like I said, doing this for over forty years, and you have a thick skin, and you're used to dealing with trolls. Is I want to talk about how groundbreaking the early Twisted Sister look was when you were playing biker bars pretty much in i don't know if i'd call it drag but it kind of was drag oh no it was, kind of it was like drag the only thing i didn't have was the push-up <laughs> i remember i remember going i mean i was wearing literal women's clothing there's pictures of me with lingerie on and stockings and you know all kinds of ex exotic things i remember uh, the rock and roll hall of fame wanted to uh 
have my display my stay hungry my most famous out uh, outfit mm -hmm. and i would and i basically just have this big box where i throw the outfits in and it's like sediment you know it's like you think that we'd have it all preserved and hanging but it's all just it's all like it's, it smells like and I, I didn't wash it the, i've never washed the last time throw it in the box so this was several years ago i'm going through the box and i'm peeling back the layers and my kids are watching and, and as we get through the famous costumes we start to get down to women's clothing so mm -hmm. yeah it was ground it was groundbreaking but the fact was we were post new york dolls and i couldn't understand why people were still reacting so violently and it was violent uh to something that was considered already passe the early 70s glitter glam of bowie and new york dolls was had like passed it was over and done and yet i'm still fighting for my life every night in the stupid bars of the suburbs Really? Like when you say violent, you mean that literally physically violent? Yeah, yeah physically violent. People tried to I kick mean, their I, ass? It was, it was, it was, I was lead vocals and security. I mean, I, I wasn't a night, I wasn't off the stage mixing it up with somebody in the limited crowd in my negligee top and fishnet stockings, which probably just added to the shame and humiliation. I had to go back and say, wow, you got your ass kicked. Who did it? And that's really embarrassing when a guy with wearing pink nail polish beats your ass. Um, <laughs> so yeah, but that's what I remember having straight razors held to my throat one time and after a show, I, I mean, just rumbles, rumbles, uh, just ugly rumbles and fights and uh, just like, for what? Again, you know, because I didn't like disco. Because, and by the way, I was very loud about not liking disco back then too. So, uh, but whatever the reason was, it's just like incredible the re the reaction people will have to something really so in insignificant when you think about it. Guys wearing a woman's, you know, women's uh, negligee. <laughs> so what? Go out, walk out of the place in disgust, and move on to the next club. Who cares? Stay there and get into a fight with them? Why? See, this is interesting to me because it sort of actually goes back to what I was asking you about, about like the conservative streak in the hard rock fan base, because metal can be so macho. Some people might even say it borders with some people on being homophobic or transphobic when the genre, as you mentioned, going back to New York Dolls, has always played with gender blurring. And it, that goes through to Alice Cooper, to Twisted Sister, to Kiss, to Poison, to Motley Crue when they first started out for their first few albums, they were wearing so much makeup. Like, so it's bizarre to me that there'd be like that kind of like, phob those kind of phobias against anyone who's like, it's Bowie, it's a, you know, Bowie, it's a tradition. Yeah, well, you know, I, you know you've heard of selective hearing I think that there's a selective seeing going on there as well. Like they, like you'd see these like angry young men, like in the crowd for all these bands you mentioned. And they just seem to be blank blurring out the fact that you were wearing skin tight pants and you can see exactly that. Hey, he's circumcised. Uh, you know, I mean, I was told I used to wear big for a while. My wife always made my outfits were pastel spandex and I would baby pink, baby yellow, baby blue. The most masculine of the colors, it's color scheme, and uh, and I only found out recently uh, from some female fans I ran into. They were older; they had been around back then. That did, that they could see through my outfits when I sweat. The as girls know, with a if you don't wear a bra under a white t-shirt, and the right light hits it. Well, apparently, when the right light hit me, uh, you could see everything, and I had no idea. And I went home to my wife, and I said. Did you know that you could see through most pastel spandex pants you were made? She goes, yeah, why well, you didn't know that? <laughs> she, she was like, why are you surprised? <laughs> and all women know that you can see through pastel colors. You got to wear something underneath. Well, I was commando. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, a dude. dude. <laughs> is there photographic evidence of that? There is, but, I, but I've seen the photos. I've seen the big sweat marks on the crotch area. But apparently, I don't know if the flash on the light reverse whatever the lighting effect that you could see through i never knew it so um which, but it may explain why eddie ojadis would so often say to me aren't you embarrassed to walk out on stage like that and i don't know what he was i would go nope suzette made it i'm wearing it oh she made it and she didn't put a liner in it or give you a little slip or something i think she left it to me but who wants vpl you know <laughs> who wants vpl you know, guys, visible panty line, okay, for those who don't know.
Well, I have a proposal for you. I think this would be a brilliant idea. So a couple of years ago, I was interviewing Rob Halford, and he is a big fan of RuPaul's Drag Race. I'm a huge fan too. So we bonded over that. And he basically said he wanted to judge a metal themed. They've never, I don't know if you watch the show, but they have musical challenges sometimes. And they've never, they've had rap challenges and a punk rock new wave challenge. They've never had a metal challenge. And he basically started campaigning to be a judge on a, uh, on a metal themed episode of Drag Race. I feel you should do it with him. Okay. First of all, my daughter, Shy, the most brutal in metal of all my children, even though they're all metal, but she is just so but she's a uh, well, just to check her out on Instagram. She's uh, she's 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 wild, and I say that with all love and respect and pride. Um, she's a huge RuPaul's Drag Race fan, which probably makes sense since I'm her dad. And uh, but I and so I see it on in the background a lot, and it always mystifies me that I've never been asked to be a guest judge. I mean, half of them look like me when they're doing their thing, uh, you know. So so I'm stunned that I've never been asked. I'd be a great judge. And uh, by the way, that community adores me. Uh, I've gone to you know to different shows like that, and they're always like so honored that Dee Snyder is there. You're the reason why I'm doing what I do today. I go really, uh, you, you know. I mean, I guess okay, great, great. So I'm with you, Rob. I'd be totally down. I told you, well, you know, we were just my family was just on um, Family Feud, Celebrity Family Feud, kicked ass, by the way. Uh, Oh, uh, Terry Bradshaw. But when they asked us to be on, I found out we were the not only the first metal family, we were the first rock and roll family they ever had on. They've had pop, they've had dance, disco, everything else never had a rock family on. So we are the redheaded step, no offense, stepchild of, of music for some reason with all of their like hesitant to bring us out there. Yet I feel like people like me and Rob are proven you know, to be smart and interesting and uh, and well spoken, and 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 we, I think we'd be great judges. You and me, Rob, I'm down. Oh my God, we're gonna make this happen. I'm going to send this to the people at Draggers. I'm on a Please mission do. now. I want this to happen so badly. It's it's in light of the family stuff we've been talking about, and Suzette. This is this year is the mark. I don't know if it's past already, but you're. It was the 40th wedding anniversary for you guys, right? In eight. We've been together so long. We were together five years before we got married. So we even we celebrate the years because we lived together almost from the day one. So it's 45 years in April. It'll be our 40th wedding anniversary in October. Wow, congratulations. Um, obviously, it's kind of unheard of. I mean, in general, that's pretty rare. The, but it's unheard of in rock and hard rock. And, you know, I'm sure you get asked this a lot of time. But what is your secret? Because a lot of, you know, of your peers are on their like, third wife let's be honest <laughs> yeah yeah um okay when they ask you if you'd like to come to the playboy mansion and visit the grotto say no <laughs> because i've been told you sign your divorce papers as you enter uh because you ain't coming out the other side married uh yeah i just i i oddly made you know i'm, I'm, I'm not i'm not superman uh, you know just like if you're an alcoholic stay out of the bar uh, you know, so I've just stayed away from the parties. I stayed away and, you know, boring. Well, you know, when all said and done, I've got this great partner in crime, did all the makeup, all the costumes, all the hair, the bone logo, that was all Suzette. And, um, and, and my bank account's in one piece, it's intact. And, uh, and uh, so I made the right choice long-term, you know, I'm sure, but, you know, I missed out on the fun uh, that you guys were all having. Uh, but, you know, but uh, yeah, I just sort of stayed away from that stuff. I read that when you were younger, like maybe in the early days of Twisted Sister, that you kind of hid the fact that you were a family man and that you were not this big partier because it would make you seem kind of square or like uncool, like it would tamper with the rock image. Like, no, I, what I said was um, I, I wouldn't tell people I was straight as far as um, drinking and drugs because they couldn't handle that. Like if you were acting like I was acting out and dressing like I was dressing and I was wasted, they could deal with that. But to, that behavior sober was people really were put off by that. Like that meant there was something wrong with you. A drunk guy dressing like I dressed, fair enough, all's fair when you're, when you're wasted. But a guy stone sober who puts on a woman's negligee and goes out on stage and prances around, that's someone you want to stay away from. 
Interesting. It's kind of similar. It's not totally similar to Alice Cooper because Alice Cooper obviously did struggle with sobriety for many years, but he's also been, he's a family guy. He's been married to the same woman for a very long time since the eighties. And he is sober now and he has been for a long time. And he actually does have kind of this like normal existence playing golf and stuff. And, you know, so like, is it something now that you sort of embrace the fact that you have these two sides to yourself? Well, first of all, Alice had been playing golf even when he was hitting the pipe. Okay, that guy's always playing golf. So that's a weird thing too. Um, uh, you know what? I was, I was actually had, I mean, I was having breakfast with Mick Foley. You know who Mick Foley is? He's a WWE, uh, you know, wrestler. He's in the, in the Hall of Fame. Were you uh, having pancakes? We were having pancakes. Yes, okay. we were. We had our favorite little, uh, little pancake place. And we were discussing, because he is the hardcore legend. He's the guy who made cutting yourself, rolling around in tacks and glass and barbed wire, baseball bats. He created that stuff. Some of the ugliest, darkest elements of professional wrestling, all this cut, getting cut up and bloody. Uh, he had his ear torn off once. And, but he's one of the most charitable people, family man, very intelligent, written several books. And we were discussing that people think how that you can't possibly be uh, clean and sober and be this crazy rocker. You can't be uh, a family guy and a charitable uh, giving person and be the hardcore legend. And our conclusion was to explain to people, it's like a coin. There's a heads and there's a tails. You can't break the coin in half and make two coins out of it. It exists as one with both sides. It's the way it exists. And actually for us, it is the crazy side that allows the more intellectual, intelligent, calmer side to exist because we, uh, and that's one of the beauties of metal in general we, and, 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 and wrestling, you let out all that craziness and then you walk out smiling and feeling good and then you can walk around like a normal person because you were abnormal someplace else. You need to get that abnormalness out. Well, that if you hadn't had that, um, that outlet, if you hadn't had the band, if you hadn't had metal, that you might have gone down a darker path in your personal life? I have no doubt of it. I have no doubt of it. That stuff needs to come out. There was a, a study a few years ago, and you can look this up. I'm not making it up, people, that showed that headbangers grew up to be better adjusted adults than non-headbangers. And Psychology Today reached out to me. I said, why me? They said, well, because... You know, you, they see they they thought that when I was in Washington, I sort of showed that metalheads could be intelligent, rational people, and that maybe I would have an idea. I said, I have a, I know exactly why. It's that's true. We are better adjusted. And they said, why? I said, we let out the dark emotions. Dark emotions need to be released. Pain, suffering, anxiety, depression, heartbreak, you name it, all those things, it's gotta go somewhere. If it doesn't, it goes inward and we really suffer for it. Um, we let it out in the pit on the stage and we sweat and we scream and we yell and we walk out, look at, look at those pits. People are smiling afterwards. They're happy afterwards. It got to release those dark emotions. So um, I, that's why I, I'm the OG headbanger. I, I, it was called Hard Rock in the beginning. I was there for the first Sabbath album, first Zeppelin album, and I've championed metal, still champion metal. Uh, my new record's heavier than ever. I did a duet with George Corpse Grinder Fisher from Cattle Corpse. I mean, but this is, the, this, is, uh, this is what saves us. So yeah, I have no doubt things would have been very different if I did what my parents wanted me to do and got a civil service job. <laughs> Um, going back to the album Leave a Scar and also just to you know mention one more thing about Suzette is the song she or S-H-E about her you know I love the other day somebody said is this song about music and I love that because oh, I always okay. try to leave a little bit of 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 for people to put their own idea of what it might be and I and when he said that I hearkened back to uh Rod Stewart had a song where he sang you're in my heart you're in my soul you'll be my friend when I get old he was singing about soccer and the video he's kicking around a soccer ball and just that soccer has been that solace for him that huh. thing he when he he goes to and he just gets joy and pleasure and it's always there for him this said, yes, <laughs> it is about, Suzette. is about Suzette, but I like, and I, but I love the fact that somebody could read something else into it. Yeah. You know, um, I've always, now that I'm writing again, 
From time to time, I would write a heavy metal love song. I didn't want to write a power ballad because this record, uh, although at the very end, Stand is sort of this ballady moment. Uh, the rest of the record is just me basically punching you in the face and head for 11 songs. And, and then I go, now that I have your attention, and then I do Stand at the very end of the record, a very calm, very quiet song that I'm trying to get people to listen. Push back, fight back, stand up, leave a scar. That's, that's all I can tell you. That's kind of been the common theme of your music. I mean, from the beginning, sort of, you know, take a stand, right? I mean, like, and also in your personal life, obviously you'll always be connected with the PMRC, but like a song like I Want to Rock, we're not going to take it. You can't stop rock and roll. Like that's kind of always been your. Kind of, sort of, 100%. Again, go back to the beginning where I said, I realized that I'm that guy. I am the voice. I'm the guy who's been given the platform to speak for those who can't speak for themselves. I've always sort of put myself in that position. In the beginning, I was just kind of speaking for myself, but then suddenly I had all these people like getting behind me going, yes, we're with D. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. I thought I was the only guy uh, who was pissed off at his parents and the world. And uh, turns out, oh, it was a whole bunch of us. Awesome. So um, yeah, so I've, I've always been that guy, but you know what? I, I, somebody pointed this out and, and I was very, I hadn't really thought about it. They said, you're very rebellious. You're very fight the man, but you also like this, you always give hope. You're like, in, you know, so we're not going to take it, but it's like, well, we don't have to listen to you because we got this. We can do this on our own. We, we're better than that. You know, and so there's always, you look at a song on the new record, it's called Down But Never Out. It's about how COVID just kicked the sh out of the world. But I could have just called it Down and complained, but it's Down But Never Out because the point is that we will rise above this. We can come back from this. We are stronger than this. We will beat this. So I always try to, to give a little hope. And look at the, uh, you've seen the album cover? Mm -hmm. So the, the painting by this, this great artist named Marcelo, uh, we told him the title, we played a couple of songs and he came back with this insane, dark, powerful visual with a scarred heart and blood pouring down the stairs. And I loved it because it was inspired. But I said, you've got a doorway in the heart and he'd like to come from that doorway. Because mm -hmm. I always believe that no matter how tough life is and life's a bitch, um, that there is hope, there is possibility. I'm, I'm living proof of it. And I want people to know that in that door, through all that pain and suffering, there can be happiness. You know, I, and I know it's like a hippie again. Peace, I love you, I love you. That's Ozzy, I love you, we love you. He, you're a man of the people, obviously. I believe I've asked you this before, but I'm gonna ask you again. Have or will you ever consider going into politics. Obviously you were very well spoken at the PMRC, you know, 35 year or so years ago. You have no scandals, same wife for 40 years, family man, you know, um, you know, obviously unlike, you know, the last president we have, I'm not saying you go straight to the top, but you could start the, you know, the local level, civic level, work your way up to governor. You did ask me and many, many people ask me, a matter of fact, I got a call from a guy and said, listen, I'm not asking, I'm telling this influential person. He says, I'm starting a super PAC, D. Snyder. I said, Ken, no. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. He said, I'm not, I said, I'm not asking, I'm doing this. I said, no. He said, why? I said, because I've seen the job. It's terrible. These people are terrible people. They're self-serving. They've got agendas. They're now looking for the greater good. And the people who have actually gone in with genuine, like, like Billy, like that Billy Carter, Jimmy Carter, his brother mm -hmm. Billy, mm -hmm. Jimmy Carter, just a really decent human being, he got destroyed. He got chewed up and spit out by Washington. There's no place for a fair, honorable, decent, reasonable person. Nobody wants the voice of reason. They want the voice of insanity. And if I can tell you this, the loudest voices in the room are the extremes on the left and the right. And they are the smallest percentages. They sit there with their 10,000 people in our Facebook group. We're a movement. You're not a movement. You're a parade. Wave your flag and march down the street and shut the up. Because the majority, there's 7 billion people in the room. You've got 10,000 people. We're a movement. Yeah, no, you're not a movement. Okay. So, and I got to keep reminding the people in the middle. And yeah, we lean left. We land right. Look, I, I'm, a, I'm a concealed carrier. 
uh, Vice called me a, uh, you know, a gun-toting feminist, and I am. I'm so pro-women's right. I got guns, and I'll back it up. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to back it up. Go you try to stop them from, from expressing their rights, women, I'm going to shoot you. Okay, but anyway, the point is, most of us are somewhere in the middle, yet we sit there, and these are the phrases that get used. Um, let's see. I'm sure it'll work out. I trust things will be okay. It usually comes back to center. We've got all these sort of like, things will be okay in the end. And as Dr. Phil says, how's that working out for you? The world's, I said, the bed. That's because the vast majority of people have been too willing to sit back and hope for the best while the extremes on the left and right are using that silence that we have to just try and control things. No, push back, fight back, don't shut up. Tell these idiots to shut up. Are you feeling a little better about the state of the world in 2021 now? You know, we've obviously talked about your former uh, Celebrity Apprentice co-star who is no oh. longer <laughs> uh, who is no longer in the White House. We have a different person in the White House now. And, you know, it seems like, you know, obviously, you know, we have many problems still in this country. But are you feeling more hopeful than you were last time I spoke with you? Well, not having a lunatic driving the bus is a great thing. But the fact of the matter is that lunatic is still in the bus. He just moves into the back seat, okay? So he's back there uh, causing problems. You remember the bus people, the problem troublemakers in the back? Yeah, they're still in there. The biggest favor that Trump did, and it's not just there's, there, there's what's his name over there, uh, Boris in, in, in England with Brexit Boris Johnson. in Brazil. They're all over the world. There's Trump's all, they keep referring to it as Australia's Trump. The UK's Trump, everybody's got a Trump, okay? What the favor they did us is that they got these awful people to come out of the shadows. We thought we had a black president, everything's okay. No, it's not. So now they're out of the shadows and we, or if they've slinked back, now we know they're there. So no, I don't think it's better. I think they've just sort of been forced out of the forefront for a little bit, but don't fool yourself people, they're there. They're going nowhere. They were hiding. They were biding their time. They were waiting. And when they finally got someone that spoke, that they felt they could bring, it was cool to come out and expose themselves, and they did. So just know full well they're still there, and you just got to stay vigilant. Stay hungry. Stay hungry. <laughs> so now that you are, you know, you thought you were going to retire from music, you did not. You're all fired up, uh, you know, over the last year. Leave a scar as the I'm result. Fired, fired up. I'm yeah, up. maybe. Just I'm fired up. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Uh, yeah, I'm a little fired up. So what, you know, is, are you back to music? Like, are the retirement plans just on hold? Or is this now, are you saying now this is your last album? I don't know. I never, at this point, at this point I don't know. Uh, but, but I will say, as the song says, you know, I got to rock again, said, uh, it's, it's not something that I choose, just what I got to do. And, uh, and and I also say that I'll do it till the day I die. And I realize that even if I stop recording or stop uh, performing, it doesn't mean that I stop rocking. And I never thought I would stop rocking, but still it's just sort of a mindset. I mean, to be honest, there was a time when I was a kid, uh, long ago when I was a child, I assumed that rock was something we grew out of. Yeah, I just assumed that, you know, I don't know, when I, when, just when I'm about to die, like at 40, I, you know, I, can't, I figure you know, I'm like 40, like really old. Uh, I, you know, I must, I'll be like out of this, you know, yeah, like, like it'll, it'll get better. It doesn't get better, people. And thank God for that. We will be in our 80s and 90s. We will be in old folks homes and we'll be sitting there in a wheelchair. And this is what we're doing. <laughs> and someone's going to run over with and give you a sedative because you they think you're having a seizure but they won't understand that you're not having a seizure you're just singing we're not going to take it on a loop in your head and you're just banging quietly in the corner so it's not going to go away but so do i know i'll do another record i don't know i know i've got a movie i'm directing i know i just finished my first fictional novel i know i'm working on these other creative projects and they may just take over at some point, and, and I really have wanted to get out of the spotlight and more behind the scenes, writing, the idea of directing, really uh, producing, do things that were less in front of the camera, because then you don't have to worry about, do I look old? Do I look old? How's... Keep moisturizing. People say, what's the secret? 
keep moisturizing and also marry your hairdresser and makeup artist. There you go. Good advice. Well, before I let you go real quick, what uh, can you tell me about those other projects? You said book, Peacock show, movie. I keep forgetting how many things I'm working on. I've got, yeah, uh, Peacock's developing a new kids animated show. I, I joined forces with some people with the idea of creating a children's animated show that parents wouldn't want to kill themselves hearing on a loop in the minivan. And, the, and, when, and, and pitching the thing, people were blown away by my songs. My God, these are so good. They're really real rock songs. I'm like, well, this is when you hire someone who actually had a hit record, you get good songs. Hire the Wiggles, people who failed in their music career and said, well, I guess I'll write children's songs then. You get dog <laughs> Okay, so yeah, do you think the guy who wrote Barney had a 5 million selling album hanging on his the Barney songs? No. That was a guy who couldn't cut it in rock and roll. All right, that's number one. Then I, I, I want, I've been working on my writing for over 30 years now and I'm really getting good at it. So, and I've written my first fictional novel with shopping that now, nothing to do with rock and roll, coming of age story based on where I grew up. Uh, I've got a horror movie called My Enemy's Enemy. I'll be directing, being produced by the people who do the Halloween franchise. We're also developing a horror television series that I've created. Um, that I can't talk more details about, but that's being developed right now. And I know there's, oh, I'm involved with a, a, um, a new Broadway production called Rock Me Amadeus Live that's being developed right now that I'm gonna be a part of. Uh, that I, you can see we've done little, it has it, like, you heard what jukebox musicals are? Mm -hmm. uh, well, this is, uses mashups of classical music and rock music as the soundtrack for the show. Nice. And you can see we've got some videos, Rock Me Amadeus Live, I, I, live, I did Love Hurts mixed up with Uninvited by Alanis Morissette and, and uh, some classical song as well. So that's how those, those, those are available on YouTube right now. But anyway, I, I lose track of the things I'm working on um, because that's the way it should be. You should just constantly be working on something new and exciting. And I'd much rather talk to you about the next project than talk to you about the past, even though I'm proud of my past. It's just the new, the new stuff's exciting. So on that note, I've got to go and do Jump, jump in my car and go to my next uh, interview, but I love talking to you. I love speaking with you. I'm adding one more thing to your to-do list yeah. of all the things. RuPaul's Drag Race, hey, season 17. In light of, get somebody over there to start thinking about that. Maybe start a Yahoo campaign it's, on this. It's on. You know, you got Rob and me. What else do you need? Alice, I'm sure Alice would do it in a hot oh play. Me and Alice are friends. So I know Alice will be in. Rob's in. Dee's in. You know, and I'm sure Gene or Paul will jump in there once they hear that. Well, if they're doing it, well, let me tell you something. I invented this. So uh, <laughs> we got Gene, we got Gene Simmons there as well. All right. It's on. The Yahoo campaign starts here. In the meantime, Leave a Scar is great. Congratulations. I'm glad you're, you're doing music again. I'm glad you didn't retire. And uh, it seems like you're a busy guy. So I'll let you go for now. Great talking to you, Lindsay. Take care. You too, Dee. Bye. Right, bye bye.